Okay, so we are in the early uh, parts of chapter five, if I'm remembering this correctly. 4.7 is antiderivatives, and then chapter five gives us integrals. And integrals and antiderivatives are very closely related. There, let's see if we can move that a bit. So we're starting with some reminders because even if you were diligent in how to this one, I know that winter break can kind of knock things out of our minds. And anti derivative of a function lowercase f of x is another function traditionally called uppercase f of x, easy enough when you're reading it, kind of a pain when you're talking out loud, but an antiderivative of lowercase f of x is a function capital F of x, such that that's a standard abbreviation if you haven't seen it before, the derivative of uppercase F of X is lowercase F of X. So, for example, if lowercase F of X or 2x, then uppercase f of x could be x squared. Because the derivative of x squared is 2x. And if you were listening closely, I said an antiderivative of 2x could be x squared, but antiderivatives aren't unique. x squared plus 3, for example, is also an antiderivative. However, Another reminder of a very important fact. Antiderivatives are unique. And here's up to is one of those phrases that gets thrown a lot around a lot in mathematics, and I'm not sure it's actually very clear, but up to constant addition. And all this very sort of fancy sounding phrase means is that once you found an antiderivative, the other antiderivatives are just that antiderivative plus a constant. So when we found two um, x squared, every other antiderivative is just x squared plus a constant, x squared plus three. 
Um, ordinarily, we take as kind of the fundamental antiderivative. That's not a formal phrase. But normally, we sort of try to find the antiderivative where the constant is zero as our first step. So you notice that we did that there. We started by finding x squared, and then we said, well, we can add a constant, we can add three to it, and it's still an antiderivative. Now, intimately related to the antiderivatives, are the indefinite integrals. And in fact, antiderivatives and indefinite integrals are essentially the same thing. We just, we get sick of writing that antiderivative of this function is something else. So we want some notation, so we don't have to write that out every time. This notation denotes the indefinite integral. Um, this dx just tells you what the variable is. In this class, that's not really going to come up. There is only going to be one variable. But for example, if instead of x, our variable was t, we'd write it like that, f of t dt. And the indefinite integral essentially is the antiderivative. Um, the indefinite integral of 2x dx is x squared plus c. The only real difference between antiderivatives and indefinite integrals is that the C term. You know, going back here, x squared is a perfectly fine antiderivative of 2x. If all you're asked for is find an antiderivative, then x squared is a solution to the problem. When we're finding indefinite integrals, we're looking for all of the antiderivatives at once, so that plus c has to be there. If I covered it up or erased it, as the case might be, I would now have an error on the whiteboard that uh, plus c is mandatory. So that's our sort of 10 minute crash course on antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. We do not at this point in time know how to take a whole lot of antiderivatives, how to find a whole lot of antiderivatives. Um, we know that the integral of a power function can be taken sort of using the anti-power rule. Instead of subtracting one, we're undoing differentiation. So we add one. And then instead of multiplying by the power, we're on doing differentiation. So we divide by the power. Uh, this rule works for almost every k. There's only one k it breaks for.
and that k is negative one. Negative one power is the same as one over x. And this rule we have written up on the top of the frame can't work here, because if we tried to use the rule, well, negative one would bump up to zero. And then we have to divide by zero, and division by zero, of course, is not an allowed operator. This is a natural log. Natural logs and um, exponentials get, always give students a lot of trouble in calculus one. Very happy that we'll finally get to them in the textbook in calculus two, and we'll now have homework problems helping students drill this material. Uh, that absolute value on the right is because we can divide by a negative number, but we can't take the um, absolute value of a negative number. So x on the left is allowed to be negative. The absolute value means that x on the right is allowed to be negative. See, sort of going out of order from the textbook a bit, but it kind of has to be done. The standard or the natural exponential e to the x is its own derivative, so it's its own antiderivative. <laughs> or rather it's its own indefinite integral. And finally, you know some trig integrals, but the trig integrals you know are kind of scattered. You know that the integral of the cosine is the sine because the derivative of the sine is the cosine. We don't, we could, we could work out without a huge, a lot of difficulty, probably, that the integral of the sine is, the negative cosine. So the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine, meaning that the derivative of the negative cosine is the negative negative sine or the positive sine. Uh, that was just typo there, not the x. What plus? And these are all of the trig integrals we know. And really, they're all of the trig intervals, integrals, I should say, that we're probably going to commit to memory. Like, I could figure out the integral of the tangent, but I do not have it stored to recall. And Again, this is just because of the derivatives that we know. We have an antiderivative for every derivative. So when you think of the other trig derivatives, there's stuff like, well, the, the integral of the secant squared is the tangent because the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared.
squared. And let's see, let me try to go through these. The derivative of the secant top, the antiderivative of the secant times the tangent is the secant. And then there are the tangent, secant, sine, and cosine are the most sort of the four real, the important um, trig functions. But there are, let me see, what would the other two be? The derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. The derivative of the cosecant is the negative cosecant times the cotangent. So that gives us an antiderivative. And then the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. So the derivative of the cotangent is the negative cosecant squared. But I don't really care that much about the cosecant and the cotangent. I mean, maybe in homework where you can just look stuff up, but that's so on tests where we only, we only encourage students to memorize the stuff that's, that's important, or at least that's my philosophy. Um, so this is a detour, but at this point we can sort of see why it's the sine, the cosine, the tangent, and the secant. I mean, the sine, the cosine, and tangent are maybe self-evident. They're the first three trig functions we always learn. You know, Sokotoa in college geometry. Then you take the derivative of the tangent and the secant shows up. And you take the derivative of the secant and more secants and more tangent show up. So if you start with the sine, cosine, and tangent, and you start taking derivatives, you get the secant, but you never get the cosecant and you never get the cotangent. So those four functions are kind of this self-contained set with these other two trig functions on the outside. We will learn, I don't know that we'll memorize any more antiderivatives. We'll learn how to take other antiderivatives. Like the big function, I mean, the trig functions, most of them aren't on this list. So we don't know how to take the antiderivative, the indefinite integral of the tangent or the secant. We'll learn to do that. We don't know how to integrate the natural logarithm. We'll learn to do that. And then we'll learn a variety of other tricks as well. So from indefinite integrals, we passed to definite integrals. We know that definite integrals are related to indefinite integrals. 
hardly because they better be with that name and hardly because they'd better be with this notation. But at the very end of calculus one, we learn what the relationship actually is. So let's first of all remind ourselves sort of what definite integrals are. Speaking informally, these are areas under or above the curves. So if we've got a positive function, if this is f of x and we start at a and we end at b, then the definite integral is giving us that area. And this understanding of the definite integral is inexact, um, or rather let's say it's limited. It, it really sort of only makes sense if the function is positive. If the function is negative, I don't think we really had time to talk about this last semester with our sort of weird meeting schedule. If the function is, you know, sometimes negative or always negative, we can still think of the definite integral in terms of area, but it's going to be a weighted area in the sense that we have, you know, the area of this region up here where it's above the curve and the area of this region here where it's above the curve. And then now the phrase area below the curve breaks down because that's area isn't below the curve, it's above it, but we've got that area where the curve is negative. And positive areas, or rather, let me try that again, where the function is positive, they give positive areas and we add them. Where the function is negative, we get negative areas and we subtract them. So for example, let me see if I can do this off the top of my head. The integral from At a range bar there. The integral from zero to two pi of the sine of x dx is zero. And we can figure this out using the fundamental theorem, which I'll review momentarily. But in terms of area, it's the area looks like this, and this area, and this area are exactly the same, and one of them's positive, and the other's negative, so the integral is zero. This brings us in our review, you know, to actually trying to find these integrals. Here, we just did it by looking at a graph, but at the end of calculus one,
we presented the fundamental theorem of calculus in two parts. And calculus two is almost entirely concerned with the second part of the fundamental theorem. I gave my little sh 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 spiel in calculus one. I said, well, both parts are important, but the second part tends to be the one that people work with in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's because the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us how to numerically find a definite integral. Definite integrals are numbers. Remember, they're areas or weighted areas. So they're different beasts from indefinite integrals, which are functions. But they're related to indefinite integrals in the sense that indefinite integrals are basically just antiderivatives. And to find definite integrals, we need antiderivatives. We find an antiderivative, we plug in the um, plug in the so-called limits of integration, A and B, and we subtract. So, for example, the integral from one to four of, you know, it's simple, but let's keep with two X, since we've already done two X. To find this integral, we need an antiderivative, x squared, and then we need to plug in one, and we need to plug in four, and we need to subtract. And our notation for that is a vertical bar with a one down here and a four up there. That vertical bar says, plug in those numbers, that one and that four, and subtract them. More than, um, More than giving a method for finding definite integrals, because I mean, I'm going to be blunt, a lot of definite integrals, if you want to find them, you just go to a machine. You know, I mean, finding, indef finding definite integrals by hand is something you want to be able to do with simple definite integrals. But a lot of time, you'll just be using technology, like some kind of computer algebra system. But even if you're using technology, this understanding, this theorem, this fundamental theorem is really important because it's telling you what the definite integral is in a more concrete way than it's the weighted area under the curve. So what the book calls the net change theorem is just, just in scare quotes, but it's just the second part of the fundamental theorem rephrased a little. 
The net change theorem says that if you have an integral of a derivative, an integral of a rate of change, Well, that's the antiderivative subtracted. And this is the net change of the function on the interval from A to B. So usually when you're taking definite integrals, the thing you're integrating is a rate of change. The fundamental theorem kind of obscures that because of the way it's written. The fundamental theorem is written, well, we have a function, so then we need to find its antiderivative. In reality, the way it usually works is, so we have the derivative, and we need to find the original function. And as far as net change, I mean, let's say an object moves with velocity that changes with time. Let's say its velocity is This v of t equals two minus two t, where time is going to be measured in seconds. Distance is going to be measured in feet, so feet per second. So the velocity, if we start at time zero, this object has a positive velocity. If we think of movement on a number line, this object starts by going to the right. Then when time gets big, when time gets bigger than one in point of fact, the velocity will become negative and the object will start moving to the left. So what something like, what, what is this? Sorry, Zoom's trouble. What something like the integral from zero to four, of v of t dt is telling you. Now so remember that the velocity is the derivative of the position function. And according to the fundamental theorem, this is the position function after four seconds minus the position function after zero seconds. So here's where the object started. Here's where the object wound up. This distance is the net change that the object experienced. It's negative because in the net, 
the object moved to the left. It sometimes went right and sometimes went left, but it ended up to the left of where it started. So this is the net change. It's, I've never actually heard this phrase used, but I guess the alternative would be the gross change. Um, this is not telling us how far the object moved. It, like if, if you're in a car and you look at your mileage go up, your mileage went up as you move to the right, your mileage went up as you move to the left. This isn't giving you the mileage, it's giving you the net change in positions, where you ended up versus where you started. So quite, uh, we moved through that quite quickly, but I certainly, I hope this was review for everyone, just sort of hitting the high points to remind ourselves of where we left off. We will continue this uh, tomorrow. We'll start looking at U substitution, which we got to at the very end of calculus one, but didn't really have time to do much with. So remember, right and early, our meeting is at eight instead of nine on Tuesday, and I will see you then. Welcome back to Adrian and back to the campus and I hope we all have a good semester.